I'm Dalton Roberts, and I'm the pastor of Parkway Baptist Church in Trinity, Alabama. And I'm here in Webster, New York at the Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church, and we're having a wonderful time with Pastor Jack Young. And we are having a biblical preaching workshop. We have uh, hosted numerous biblical preaching workshops, had a couple at our church in Alabama, and we've had one up in two, I think, up in Maine. And so it's a new thing that we're doing, and I'm very excited about it. It is our goal to encourage preachers not only to determine to preach the Word of God, to preach sermons that are shaped by the Scripture, where the Scripture is the sermon, but it is our goal to, to, to do some teaching and to provide some information, some extended education in the subject, in the area of biblical preaching, trying to be an encouragement to preachers, pastors, missionaries in the area of the most important work that we do, and that is preaching the Bible. I mean, we're having a great time here. We have James Knox from DeLand, Florida. There's not a better preacher anywhere than Brother Knox, and man, he has really fed us and encouraged us in the Word of God. And so I hope you'll enjoy these videos, and they will give you an indication of what we're trying to do. We, we don't have all the answers. We are just trying to share some good information. And we do believe, it is our conviction, that if preaching is not biblical, I don't mean using the Bible, but if it is not shaped by the Scripture, if the Word of God in its context is not the point of the preaching, it's not biblical preaching. And we hope that this will be an encouragement to you, and maybe you can look up one of our uh, workshops in the future and attend, and we hope it would be a blessing to you. Okay, here we go. Let's start our afternoon session in 1 Timothy chapter 4. And verse 13, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 13. Appreciate a good turnout on a Tuesday. Amen. It's a blessing and it's a joy listening as you are fellowshipping between sessions and as you're at the tables and lunch. What a blessing to have a, a number of churches in one area that yeah. get along with each other and fellowship together and work together. That's, that's really, really a joy. That's a, a, a blessing. All right, it's 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Let's we'll start at 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with laying on of the hands of the presbytery, meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may, be, may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself, under the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Father, help us this afternoon, please. Uh, be attentive, learn, uh, be better for having come. We thank you in Jesus' name, and amen. Here's the simple point from these verses that I wanted to make with you. Timothy is gifted. He has been given a gift by the Holy Spirit. If, if you want to match it up with 1 Corinthians, one of the, or Ephesians 4, one of the gifts is pastor and teacher. Paul has left Timothy at Ephesus to pastor that church, and he's referring to that gift. He's a gifted man. The gift was recognized by the laying on of hands. And what does the Holy Spirit point out to us? Your spiritual gift does not exempt you from the need to study. Your spiritual gift, your God-given abilities do not rule out the necessity of you giving yourself wholeheartedly to stirring up, developing, making proper use of that gift. Uh, you say, uh, why is he told to give attendance to reading if he has a gift? Why is he told to give attendance to, uh, to exhortation if he has a gift? Why is he told to, to give attention to doctrine if he has a gift? Because the gift is what God will, will use in your life, but you've got to give God what God's given you something to work with. Now you've got to give him something to work with. And so I, I find that significant. Look again in, in um, chapter number 5, 1 Timothy 5 <coughs> and verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor 
in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, the, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. That we have, we have so many things that fall under the heading of our responsibility. And I'm not, I'm not dis, discarding or making light of any of those things. But if, if my job, can we, can we speak what, carnally? If my job is to preach and teach the Word of God, what should my attitude be as I preach to men who work 40, 50, 60 hours a week at their job? If I haven't worked at my job and I hope God's going to drop a sermon on me when I get in the pulpit. I'm speaking to laboring men. How do I earn their respect if I'm not laboring at my craft? I have men where we live who work in the very hot, miserable Florida humidity. You have men up here that work in, this, in the cold and hard conditions, and they come to church. You don't want their perception of you to be, what's this guy been doing all week? <laughs> he's up there talking like he's hoping that, that, that words are going to appear on a teleprompter for him to read because he doesn't have a sermon. And I, I would just think as a matter of integrity, brother, we ought to work as hard at our craft as any man in our church works at his. We ought, to, we ought to toil as many hours as they toil. And say, man, sometimes, you know, I, I had hospital visits to make and, and had uh, this situation came up with a family. We had to do some counseling and some, some intervention type of stuff. And it really took me away from, from sermon prep. Did it take you away from sermon prep? Well, you know, the guy that's, that is in your church that, that's uh, an excavator, when his machine broke down, you know what he did? He stayed until it got fixed. And then he stayed till 10 o'clock at night working with the car headlights to finish the job because that's his, that's his job. Okay, so you got held up. You had three or four hours. Unexpected stuff came up during the day. Uh, set the alarm earlier. Stay up later. I'm, I'm just saying it's, it, people have the perception that men go in the ministry because they don't want to work. We shouldn't contribute to that perception. And so he's, he said that it, it's, it's an honorable thing. I've read these articles and so have you. The preacher ought to get double honor over everybody in the church. No, if he labors in the word and doctrine, he ought to get double honor. And we're, we're compared to an ox treading out the corn. Have you ever seen that? You ever watched that? Second, second time in two days, here's this agricultural reference. There's a wheel and there's a post and, and the ox is responsible for turning that wheel around that post all day long to grind that grain. You know what that is? It's boring. <laughs> it's not exciting. Not a lot of wow moments in an ox treading out the corn. And I'll give you away, give away, give away another sermon. See how you like this. I want to go in the ministry because I want to see souls saved and lives changed and God move. Moses pastored 40 years. If according to the Bible record, only about six exciting things happened in 40 years. And all of them were bad. <laughs> 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 Think about that. This guy's pastoring a million and a half people. You know what they did? They got up every morning and got manna. And they went out every evening and got manna. And every once in a while, they'd used up all the resources and had to move the tents and go pitch somewhere else. And every once in a while, like every four or five years, I don't know, Cora rebels, poison serpents start biting people and they're dying. There's really not a lot of wow moments in Moses' pastorate. Most of it's just, 
sitting there all day while people line up to ask him questions and tell him about their problems. You know what our job is? Tread the corn, man. Just go around the wheel another time. Go around the wheel another time. Why? People need to be fed. Why is the oxen going around the wheel? People need to be fed. All right, look at this one. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse number 14 of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them for the Lord. They strive not about words, no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word truth, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Study, only your King James Bible has that word there, study to show their self approved but then look, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Study and work side by side in the same context. Study and work. I guys tell me, so, I know one preacher, he's one of the best preachers I know, one of the best pastors I know. He says, brother, it takes me all day Monday, do my Sunday morning sermon, all day Tuesday, do my Sunday evening service, all day Wednesday to do the following Wednesday service. And then he said, on Thursday, I, I rehearse them. You know what he's doing? He's working at it. He's working at it. I was in a meeting one time, and we were at lunch, kind of like we were here, and a bunch of young preachers around. And, and if you go to some of these camp meetings or these, these fellowship meetings, they, these singers get up to sing, man, and the place comes unglued. Woo, hi, glory to God. And the preachers get up and just, <laughs> and uh, so those young guys asked me, said, said, how come you think it is that when the, the singers uh, sing, everybody gets all blessed and happy like that? When the preachers preach, nothing happens. I said, the singers practice. <laughs> the singers work on those songs over and over and over and over again so they're as good as they can be. We just get up and say a quick prayer and hope God will overcome our lack of preparation. Amen. You know, uh, Brother uh, uh, Robertson keeps bringing up football. You think he's he got a problem with that? He's a little. Uh, <laughs> he's in mourning right now. <laughs> but you know something? Uh, I was in in college and had a course in advertising, part of getting a journalism degree, and one of the units was on the the ad rates and ad prices and all that. And some guy took a stopwatch when the ball was snapped until the whistle was blown. A Super Bowl game ran over four hours and less than eight minutes of the time was anybody playing football. That's a lot of practice for a few three, four, five second plays. Practice, 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 practice. I wonder, brother, not, I don't know you. Are you working at preaching? Man, that's good. Are, are you working as hard to be a good preacher as your teenage sons are working at being a good baseball player? Are you working as hard at being a good preacher as your musicians work at being a good piano player? I mean, thank God for a gift. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. We're not, we're not downplaying that. But the Holy Spirit who gave the gifts said, I want you to study like a workman. Like a what? A workman need not be ashamed. <laughs> Maybe sometimes we're, our, our preaching is uh, our sermons or something to be ashamed of because we hadn't worked at it. Yes. All right. Look in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy 4. Brother uh, Don't touched on this. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 4. Paul, as far as we know, wrote a third of the New Testament. And here's what he said. Verse 13, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, you know, it's hanging on the rack out there. It was cold when I came in, warm when I left. I forgot it. <laughs> when, when thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. Why would the Apostle Paul, who could write Bible books under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, need to read books? 
Well, I don't read any other books. I said that once, and the man I said it to said, do you listen to sermons? Well, why would you listen to sermons and not read books? Why would you not take advantage of what of someone else's labor? I, everybody got questions they want to ask when they get to heaven. I want to know what books Paul read. Yeah. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't, that be, wouldn't that be interesting? Okay, come to Ecclesiastes. Purpose-driven Ecclesi- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Purpose <driven> prisoner. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 12. This I find really interesting. And if you don't, that's okay. You had a good lunch. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Where is it? Oh, yeah, there it is. Ecclesiastes, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes 12. We would say, and we know this from the Bible record, Solomon was given a gift by God of wisdom that excelled that of every living man of his day, maybe of any day. Right? Okay, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 9. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth, the words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies which are given from uh, one uh, shepherd. And further, by these my son be admonished of making many books there is no end and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Why is Solomon studying until his flesh is worn out? Why is Solomon seeking out proverbs and knowledge and books and understanding when he has this God-given wisdom superior to all other men? Is it, is it fair for me to ask you and ask myself, if Solomon devoted himself to study, shouldn't I? <laughs> if Solomon wore himself out trying to improve upon his God-given wisdom, Shouldn't we? Amen. Now, here's a fair question. I, I, if, I, if I stood before this afternoon and, and you have any experience in any of these areas, you would agree with me. We would say, um, <clears throat> ditch digging is a, is a weariness to the flesh. Roofing is a weariness to the flesh. Uh, laying block is a weariness to the flesh. Florida, you want a good job? Come to Florida and be the guy with the shovel following the asphalt machine. Weariness to the flesh. I looked out one day and there's, anyway, uh, lands, lawn, lawn work, landscaping, lawn mowing, weariness to flesh. What are your study habits like? Solomon said much study is a weariness of the flesh. Have you ever dug for truth and searched the Word of God and prayed and labored over doctrines and sermons and series of sermons until you were just worn out? Say, so, well, you know, people, I, I preached this sermon, people didn't get anything. Maybe there wasn't anything to get. <laughs> Come on, guys. Are we, are we, let me, let me see this the polite way. Are we taking full advantage of the wonderful opportunity that is ours? That laboring people are contributing to our family's maintenance so that we are free to study the Word of God and instead we're doing something else than studying the Word of God and hoping when Sunday rolls around that God will cover up for my neglect of my duty. They prayed, but it's prayer and the, minute, and the word. So, Timothy has a gift, but he's still studying. Paul has this unique calling and anointing, but he's still reading books and parchments. And Solomon has this God-given wisdom and he's wearing himself out trying to learn more. 
Let's, 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 it's not a secular job. It's not a carnal job. But let's be realistic. This is our job. And we ought to work at it as hard as the other men in our church work at their jobs. I think they'd respect us more if we did. All right. In Galatians 1, here's what I want to talk to you about in a few minutes that I have before you're completely gone. <laughs> Galatians chapter number 1. There's three ways to people fall asleep in church. Put this in your notes if you want to. <laughs> there's the... I know I'm about gone, so I'm going to look like I'm deep in thought or praying. <laughs> and there's the, my head weighs 50 pounds like a cement block, and I just can't hold it up anymore. Have you seen those? And then there's the, the, the bird in the nest, <laughs> the baby bird waiting for mama to come with the worms, so... There was a meet one time in Michigan, and this guy's on the front row, and he got the cement block for the head thing, and he's doing this, and he's doing this, and he's doing this, and he finally, he went so sound asleep, he fell out of the pew and landed face first on the ground, and the guy had such presence of mind, he crawled to the altar and, and started laughing. And everybody, oh, bless him, Lord, bless him. And people are coming up and praying, putting their hands on him and praying over him. They, they thought God had got a hold of him. So, <laughs> that's, that's some great things happen in church. All right. There, there's a way that we can double down on our Bible teaching. And that is when, it, when we give illustrations... What if instead of making up some hero tale about ourself, what if we used something that happened in the Bible as our illustration? Amen. Amen. Teach a truth and then illustrate it not with something you did, but with something that somebody in the Bible did. So I'll take a few minutes and, and show you an example of this and because uh, I enjoy the story, but I think it well illustrates what, I, what I'm talking about here. So Galatians chapter 1 verse 6 I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. If, if he was marveling back in those days, he ought to see how fast it happens with the internet, and, uh, <laughs> which, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. So what will we say to our church? If, if it doesn't match what God gave you in his word, don't believe it. Even if Moroni brings you some gold plates, don't, don't fall for it. It's a dangerous thing to listen to. A, a, what, what, what if another preacher Dangerous thing. What if, a, what if a respected man? Dangerous thing. What if an angel? Dangerous thing. Now, we would preach that. Come with me to 1 Kings chapter 13. 1 Kings chapter 13. We are an angel from heaven. Preach unto you any other doctrine. <clears throat> All right, 1 Kings 13, 1. Behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. 1 Kings 13, 1, man of God. That's a pretty good designation in the Bible. And he's, he's obeying the word of the Lord, and he's coming to Bethel, house of bread, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. The king's got no business burning incense at an altar. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born in the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. What a man. He is preaching judgment upon the king. What a guy. And it came to pass when, the, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. 
And his hand which he put forth against him dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him. Oh, I know we live in New Testament times and grace and all that, but don't you wish God would do something like that for you once in a while? Okay, just once. <laughs> Listen here, preacher. <laughs> and his arm just freezes like that. I've thought about that. I've been out there street preaching. Some guy rides by and holds out his arm and gives you the we're number one. <laughs> what if God just froze him like that? <laughs> he gets to work and no, no, boss, I, I, I did not you. <laughs> Gets out of the car at the gas station. Four guys beat him up, you know. No, I can't, I can't help it. <laughs> but God doesn't, do, doesn't seem to do like stuff like that for me like he did for this guy. <laughs> anyway, so his arm, it just frozen in place. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. What power God gave this bold, courageous preacher. And the king answered and said to the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God and pray for me that my hand may be restored me again. Physical troubles get your attention, don't they? So this preacher that he's cursing, now he wants the preacher to pray for him. And the man of God besought the Lord and the king's hand was restored him again. Became as it was before. If verse 6 ended the story, <clears throat> this would be one of the hero tales and all the flannel graphs and vacation Bible school stories Everybody know about this man of God. And the king said unto the man of God, <clears throat> Come home with me. Refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. Not every day a preacher gets invited to dine with the king. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread nor drink water nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Wow. The story just got even better. What a man. Half the kingdom to just have lunch with me? Can't do it can't do it, your majesty. I know I'm just a kid preacher, and I know you're the king, but I can't come have lunch with you. God told me not to stop and eat or drink. He said, come here and preach and go home and don't stop. And king, I've got a higher authority in my life than the king of Israel. It's my God. What a man. All right, verse 11. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and he had a wife named Ethel. <laughs> it's, it's just the perfect cadence for what the... What <laughs> You'll never unhear that once you've heard it. <laughs> I've been trying to come up for years with the rest of it, but I, I can't kick, get a third rhyme for Bethel. <laughs> anyway, there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, <laughs> What was his wife's name? Apple. Yeah, good, good. And his sons came and told him all the works the man of God had done that day in Bethel. Uh, the words which he had spoken of the king, uh, them they told also their father. And their father said to them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went which came from Judah. And he said to his sons, Saddle me the ass. The, uh, the ESV says, Get me the car. <laughs> so, so they saddled him the ass and he rode thereon. And went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak, and he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. And he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place, for it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou should eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. And he said unto him, I am a prophet as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. 
What do you have in Galatians? Though we or an angel. You know what you have? I'm a man of God like you. Well, you know, the first, let's just assume this young man is just a very polite, gracious young preacher. Or let's suppose he's a young preacher like I was and like Brother Dalton is. Was. (laughs) Like we all are. Wouldn't your first thought be, if you're a prophet like me, why'd I have to travel halfway across the county to preach to this king? How come you weren't in his face? If he's a prophet like this young guy, God would have got him to do the job. Well, what's he saying? I'm an older preacher. I've been at this longer than you have. God might have spoken to you, but God and an angel spoke to me. My angel trumps your God speaking. Galatians says it doesn't. My experience and my years in the ministry trump your upstart young man's life. The scripture says it doesn't. Well, what happens? Verse 19, so he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. It came to pass as they sat at the table. The word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, and hast eaten bread, drunk water, in the place at which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread, drink no water, thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. So how dare that man? Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. When a man speaks truth, he's speaking the truth. When the man lies, he's lying. That's why you can't just believe everybody's preaching. Well, he's got a lot of good truth. Then, then latch on to the truth. But when somebody says something goes contrary to the Word of God, you've got to disrespect that man, not disrespect the Word of God. This young man made a mistake in his, let's just say, in his kindness, let's just say in his, in his decency, he had more respect for this old preacher than he had for what God told him. You're told not to do that. He thought, surely if an angel sends a message, but wait a minute, God created angels to be his ministering servants. Why would you listen to an angel over God? What a kid took on the king, spoke the word of the Lord, watched the altar break, healed the king that lifted a hand against him, refused half the kingdom. So far, so good. But then, then he believed a lie instead of sticking with the word of God. Verse number 20, uh, I'm sorry, 23 came to pass after he'd eaten bread, after he had drunk, he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way and the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. That is a strange scene, man. A lion leaps, rips a guy off a donkey kills the guy and the donkey just stands there? (laughs) A lion kills a guy and doesn't take one bite out of him? Doesn't lift one paw against the donkey? Just stands there? That's a strange business, don't you know? Now here's the the lesson, if we're going to preach this and teach this, here's the lesson. If that boy had gone straight home When that lion came walking down that path, that boy would have been home with his feet under his own table. He'd have never encountered that lion. But when he disobeyed God, he got off God's schedule and got on the lion's schedule, and now he's dead. So, beloved... When the apostle warns us, the Holy Spirit warns us through the apostle in Galatians chapter 1, 
to take every sermon and every pamphlet and every internet video and every voice you hear in the church lobby and make sure it lines up with the Word of God. And if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, don't believe it. Why? Because this matter is far more serious than you think it is. There is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. What have we done? We've taken two verses in the New Testament and instead of telling stories about a preacher we knew that messed up, we can teach a chapter of the Bible. Now people not only know this chapter and not only know this story, but certainly understand the severity of listening to a voice that goes against the Bible. In verse number 25, Behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way and the lion standing by the carcass and they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt and when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Isn't that a sad way to remember what could have been one of the great stories in the Old Testament? Instead of being the man of God that took on the king, the man of God that taught the king not to meddle in the priesthood, it's the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. What a sad end. The Bible says, Therefore the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion which had torn him and slain him according to the word of the Lord which he spake unto him. And he spake to his son saying, Sound the ass, settled him, went and found his carcass, cast in the way. The ass, lion, stand by the carcass, lion not eating the carcass nor torn the ass. The prophet took up the carcass, the man of God laid upon the ass, brought it back. The old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. They laid his carcass in his own grave and they mourned over him saying, Alas, my brother. Well, he belongs to the Lord, so the roaring lion couldn't devour him. But he could take him out. He can't ever become part of that lion because he belongs to the Lord. But he can't ever do anything else for God. So coming back to Galatians 1, see what we're doing here? Coming back to Galatians 1, Verse number six, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ under another gospel. Brother, sister, how bad is it to go eat lunch with somebody? It's not that big a deal, right? Wrong. Disobeying God is a big deal. Young people, I understand you don't see why mom has these rules and dad has these rules. New Christian, I, I know you don't understand why we preach against some of the things we preach against. What's wrong with going to lunch with an older preacher? No, no, no. God said, go straight home. Why? That boy didn't know there was a lion coming down the road. God did. You don't know what's coming down the road. God does. Now, the, ver the same verses that I read 20 minutes ago have so much more force to them. People have so much more to relate to in the life of someone who's not just some church member, not just some teenager, but a guy that's doing great things for God. Wow, this must really be serious. Verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. What's the warning? You don't know who the perverts are. If you trust God and obey God, you don't have to know who the perverts are. God will protect you from those who would pervert your faith. How? By just obeying Him. I don't have to read a book on Mormonism and Watchtower Society and Islam and the New Age movement. 
I just have to be true to the Bible. And anything that doesn't match the Bible, I know it could pervert me. Amen. Simplifies life. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And so, beloved, why are we still having church preaching doctrines, singing songs like they did 2,000 years ago. Because thank God there's been a line of Christianity that has lasted through the centuries that wasn't perverted. We didn't go home to lunch with men who told the truth part of the time and told lies the other part of the time. We didn't disobey God when an angel came up with something new. So what have we done? We've introduced the passage. We've explained the passage. Then we went to another part of the Bible to illustrate the passage. Now we come back and explain the passage again with much more, much more force and much more clarity and the people don't go home saying, I wonder if he really did that. I wonder if that really happened in his life. I'll tell you, this preacher had more adventures than Roy Rogers and, and Superman. I mean, it's just, no, they go home saying, wow, I didn't know that story was in the Bible. Right. Yeah. Now you have the Word of God backing up the Word of God, which is far more powerful than what happened to you at a laundromat one day. See, so whenever possible, and you, your, your Bible's filled with these. You're going to teach John chapter 3, God so loved the world. Well, back up two verses. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. God so loved the world. Now what do I do? Well, I don't assume they've ever read that in their life. I go back and read the story of the serpents in the wilderness. And all that you can introduce into that. They've been bit by serpents. They're dying of poison. Put a, put a brazen serpent on a pole and tell them to look at it. Well, that goes against all medical science. <laughs> and you come back to John 3. How are your sins going to be taken away by a man hanging on a cross 2,000 years ago? You want to die? You want to live? Do what God says. 1 Corinthians 5, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Who in your church that, that's new, who in your church that's been saved in the last year knows what Passover is? What do we do? We go back to Exodus 12. We read the story. We, we draw all the parallels to Christ. So the Lord gives us all these opportunities. We had a, a guy, if, if any of you are one, bless your heart. I'm, 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 I'm not going to argue with you. I, I've, I, I, can't, I can't do it anymore. I'm not going to argue with you. But we, we, every now and then we'll, we'll have some hyper dispensationalists make a run at us. I'm a magnet for them. I don't know why, but here they come. And uh, there's nothing, nothing if, if Paul didn't say it, we don't go by it. And then, then they get way out there. If Paul didn't say it in his last four prison epistles, right, anyway. Yeah, there you go. So I went through one time with a with a highlighter, and I started in Romans, and I for, for the to keep from having a heart attack, I, I I I stopped at Philemon. I didn't go to Hebrews. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty hard to be a hyper dispensationalist to teach that Paul wrote Hebrews, but anyway, that's we don't we don't go down that into that rabbit hole. But with a highlighter, I marked everything in Paul's epistles that was a quotation from, a reference to, or an allusion to the Old Testament. And it's about 80% of everything Paul wrote requires you to know the Old Testament. You can't be Paul only and understand Paul. <laughs> so what are we doing? When I'm teaching Romans, I have to teach. Leviticus, I have to teach Exodus, I have to teach Genesis, I, ha I have to constantly go back or nobody knows what Paul's talking about because his letters assume a knowledge of the Old Testament that our people don't have. 
So when we're talking about illustrating and cross-referencing, it fits, it fits hand in glove with expository preaching and teaching in context. Oftentimes, the context, well, the context for Galatians 1 in this case is 1 Kings 13. That's context. It's 1 Peter 5. Your adversary is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Oh, I've got to watch out. The devil can get, no, no. Didn't say who he can devour. Can is ability. Satan can devour every one of us, may devour. That's permission. Mom, can I have some cookies? I used to say that after school. She'd say, sure you can, and then wouldn't let me. <laughs> of course, I could, but I didn't have permission. And then I'd say, may I? No. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Got a mom uses grammar on you after school. Yeah. Anyway. So what happened, again, what happens in 1 Kings? The Lord gave the lion permission to take out the man of God. Matches 1 Peter 5, whom he may devour. So, so what are we doing? Explaining the text, like Nehemiah 8 says, giving more clarity to the text by going to another passage in the Bible to shine light upon our text, and then coming back to our text and making sure that in that fuller light, everyone sees it as clearly as possible. So I would encourage, if God's done some great thing in your life, work it into a sermon. But don't make your sermons about you. Amen. Don't make your sermons where people leave thinking, I wish I was like him, or I wish God worked in my life like he works in his life. Make your sermons about God's Word. Everybody has access to God's Word and God work in their lives in that, in that same way. So um, I don't know who the preacher was we, that, that you were talking about that said he wouldn't shoot somebody who broke into their home. I, I'm going to tell you a story. This has nothing to do with anything, but I just got reminiscent. So we live... We live way out in the woods, way, way out in the woods, and, and there's a, a U.S. highway runs by our property, and five miles to the, to the west of us is an interstate highway. So I woke up one morning, and I went out in, in, in the bedroom, and there's somebody sleeping on our couch. I didn't want to make, wake my wife, and so I went and looked out the window to see if there was a car out there, and there wasn't a car out there, and I went and woke up my wife, and I said, there's somebody sleeping on our couch. Well, we, we frequently have people in our church that have marriage troubles, and she said, maybe it's, and she named this guy, because we'd been working with he and his wife not very successfully, and I, I said, it, there's no way it's him. He'd have had to walk here. And so I, I got something that stays by the bedside and, and I, I went out into the living room and I woke the guy up and I said, who are you and why are you here? And he said, I know who I am, but I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> and, and so here's what happened. This guy's driving drunk on the interstate, totals his vehicle, walks out of it unhurt and tries to find his way home. <laughs> he lives like 60 miles from us. So he, he walks down the interstate. He walks five miles down this road, uh, down the state road. He turns down the dirt road where we live. He comes down our driveway because he saw a light. He comes down our driveway, gets to the back door, and it's not locked. Why would you lock your door and you live that far out in the woods? The thief's going to break your window. Anyway, <laughs> so he opens the door. He's a polite drunk. He took off his shoes and left them outside, <laughs> stepped over the pit bulldog, oh my. Oh my. and walked to the couch and fell asleep. Yeah. <laughs> and got a good night's sleep. So I woke him up, and my wife got up, and we called the sheriff. And when the sheriff came, this guy is sitting at the table with me and the dog at his feet. <laughs> And the little assistant that we keep by the bedside. 
and my wife's in the kitchen cooking him breakfast and we're telling him about Jesus and witnessing to the guy and, and giving him the gospel. And the sheriff comes out and we, we tell the sheriff the whole story and the sheriff takes off his hat and he looks at that guy and he said, you are the luckiest man in the world. And if I was you, I would listen to these people. <laughs> he said, the dog should have killed you. That man should have killed you. His wife should have killed you. And they're fixing you breakfast? <laughs> this is a sheriff's deputy. And he says, son, I think God's dealing with you. <laughs> So we drove him home and witnessed to him all the way, and, and who knows what became of him. But that was, he just made me think of what you talked about. That. So that was, uh, I've often wondered how many times since has that guy thought, I, I could be in hell right now. I better get, I don't know if he got saved yet or not, but I, I sure hope he does. But that's a crazy story, isn't it? Stupid dog. <laughs> <laughs> like, why am I feeding you, man? So, hey, all right, preacher, go ahead. Okay. 